From the Old Testament prophets of Daniel, Ezekiel, Zechariah, Isaiah, and many others, all the way to Revelation chapter 22, the Bible provides a chronological order of, event, of end time events. We are going to focus on the events we are currently living through and that we should be watching for just ahead, all while clearing up some misconceptions along the way on this edition of the End Time Show. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dave Robbins with End Time Ministries. I do thank you for joining me on this edition of the End Time Show. And what I thought I would do today, because it seems like um, now that the, this, the war is kicked off in Israel and a lot of different things are happening, um, the rise of Islam in the world, that it seems like everybody's now a, um, a prophecy guru, right? I mean, there's YouTube videos flying around and just everybody's coming out. A lot of people who never talk about prophecy, but now they're going to try to teach on it and different things. So I want to make sure that everybody gets it right. I mean, let's just stick right by the Bible here and make sure we understand. So what I want to do today is I'm going to walk through like a final seven-year timeline, just give you an overview of it. We're not going to go real deep into it. I won't have time to go deep into every point. But I want to give you an overview, and then along the way, we're going to try to clear up some of the misconceptions that I've had people asking me about, and YouTube videos that I've been sent, and different things. Uh, I want to try to clear some of that up, because it can get really foggy and muddy the waters and a lot of different things, and we want to try to stay away from that. So, the Bible foretells a final seven-year period that will immediately precede the Battle of Armageddon and the Second Coming of Jesus Christ to the earth. And it also describes the specific event that will mark the beginning of that final seven-year period. Now, here is misconception number one. Some people teach that this final seven-year period is the Great Tribulation and that the Great Tribulation lasts for the entire seven years. If you believe that, then you're going to get some of your prophecy teachings off, right? So, there is not one scripture in the entire Bible that describes a seven-year tribulation period for the end time. Okay? Now, I'm going to, I know I'm going to mess with your eschatology today, but I want to make sure that we're getting these things right, because we want to stick right by the scripture. Every description of the Great Tribulation, of the length of it, in the Bible, everyone teaches that it lasts for three and one-half years. If you got a notepad, write these scriptures down. Daniel 7.25, Revelation 12, verses 1 through 7, Revelation 11, verses 3 through 12, Revelation 12.6, Revelation 12, 7, all the way down through 17, and Revelation 13, verses 5 through 7. All of those speak about the length of the Great Tribulation, and all of them say that it's only three and one half year, years. Again, there is a final seven year period, but the Great Tribulation only lasts the final three and one half years of that. And the, misunder the misunderstanding about a seven-year tribulation comes from Daniel 9.27, which speaks of the covenant that will be confirmed for a final seven-year period. And this verse teaches that the abomination of desolation will occur halfway through the seven-year period. Well, if you go to Matthew 24, Jesus said that the abomination of desolation would mark the beginning of the great tribulation, now, some people would say, well, the first half is tribulation, the last half is great tribulation. There's no scriptures for that. The Bible says we're going to have tribulation in the world. Jesus said that you will have tribulation in the world. We're going to have tribulations from now until we hear the, the trumpet sound. 
But the great tribulation that Jesus was talking about is, begins at the abomination of desolation, which is halfway through that final seven-year period. That's Matthew 24, 15 through 21. So from this, we know that the great tribulation only lasts for three and one-half years. Now, I'm going to give you Scripture for every single point that I'm going to make today because I want to make sure that you get it, that this is not my opinion, this is not a traditional teaching that I got from some prophecy book somewhere, but we're going to go right by the Bible, okay? Again, there's not one Scripture in the Bible for a seven-year Great Tribulation period. Now, it is of utmost importance then that each of us understands the final seven years, the events that will occur chronologically on that timeline, because our generation will undoubtedly live during the fulfillment of these prophecies. So, it gets very detailed, doesn't it? But we want to make sure we get it right, because I want to know what to watch for. When this happens, then what's next? Then what's next? Then what am I looking for? And it helps us to understand the times just ahead, and it helps us navigate the waters as we go through all of this, right? So, with that said, let me mention First Cup Coffee. You know, we are, we're certainly energized and motivated by our God-given purpose here and to, to reach the world, especially with everything that's going on right now. It's really, uh, it, it's just, it, everything's just going really, really fast. And thankfully, that we are partnered with some people that are helping us reach that mission and in, in their financial support. And one of those is First Cup Coffee. First Cup Coffee, it's not a woke um, entity. They, they're not trying to do different things that are woke. Rewriting the history of or lobby to defund our military, any of these other things. Pushing the LGBTQ agendas. You're never going to see First Cup Coffee with a rainbow um, little... Uh, pod or a coffee pot or a rainbow pack. It's not going to happen. They're not that kind of a company. And we like to partner with those types of things. Um, they're a Christian-owned patriot company. They're based right out of Texas. They've got many, many different roasts. Uh, I think this morning, uh, the other morning I drank um, J John Hancock. I have Washington. There's all kinds of different ones. It's really neat. And it's actually pretty good coffee. So, all you coffee drinkers out there, go to firstcup.com, use the code ENDTIME, you get 10% off. If you subscribe, they'll give you another 10% off. Go to firstcup.com, use code ENDTIME, and get that 10% off today. Now, we're walking along this timeline, and we're clearing up some misconceptions along the way, right? We're not going off tradition. We're not going off some prophecy books and different things. We're going to stick right by the Bible, and I'm going to give you Scripture for everything that we're teaching. Okay. The Middle East Peace Treaty, that marks the beginning of the final seven years. Daniel 9, 27 prophesies that the Antichrist, okay, that's one of the misconceptions we're going to talk about. The Daniel 9, 27 prophesies that the Antichrist will confirm a covenant with many for a final seven-year period. So here's misconception number two. Some teach that the Pope will confirm the covenant. However, Scripture teaches that it will be the Antichrist that confirms the covenant for the final seven-year period. How do I know that? Well, let's go to Daniel 9, 27. The he there. The Bible says, and he will confirm the covenant. The he in Daniel 9, 27 does three things. You've got to read down through the entire verse. You can't, you can't look at verse 26 where it says, um, the people of the prince that shall come, because then... Some people have taught that that's the prince of Rome or the pope, but that simply is not the case. The Antichrist will be the, the ruler of the Holy Roman Empire. Remember, it's talking about our day. So, if you read all the way down through Daniel 9, 27, the Bible says the he there does three things. He confirms the covenant, he causes the sacrifice and the offering to cease, and he sets up the abomination of desolation. Well, Daniel chapter 11 from verse 20 all the way down through the rest of the chapter, it is referring to the Antichrist and his kingdom. So in Daniel 11, 21 through 22, it's going to tell us who 
um, does the three things mentioned in Daniel 9, 27. Remember, he confirms the covenant. So, Daniel 11, 21, and 22. It states that the Antichrist, the king of the north, will be the prince of the covenant. So it's the Antichrist that will confirm the covenant. Daniel 11, 31 says the Antichrist and his partners will take away the daily sacrifice. Daniel 11, 31 also says the Antichrist and his partners will place the abomination that maketh desolate. So the Antichrist confirms the covenant. The Antichrist causes sacrifices and the oblation to stop. And the Antichrist places the abomination of, of desolation. So it's easy to see who the he is in Daniel 9, 27. It's the Antichrist. So, this is, the, this is the confirmation of the covenant that we're talking about. And this peace agreement will be a confirmation of God's covenant with Abraham that Israel would always have a homeland promised in the promised land. That's all the way back in uh, Genesis 15, 18. Abram, I will give you the... He, st Abram, Abram is standing in the promised land at this point, And the area that would be the promised land. And he says, Abram, I will give you the, this land, this promised land, from the river down in Egypt all the way up into the great river, the river Euphrates. And so, the fulfillment of this prophecy in Daniel 9, 27 is going to be the signing of a peace agreement between Israel and the Palestinians. Now, I had somebody call, or uh, it was an email the other day. And they asked me, now this is the misconception number three. They asked me um, if the Pope's seven-year Laudato Si climate action plan, if that started the final seven years back in May of 2021. The answer to that is no. Remember, it's not the Pope that confirms the covenant and the Laudato Si seven-year climate action plan doesn't have any of the biblical characteristics of the covenant. The prophesied agreement must do five things. These are the biblical characteristics of the covenant in Daniel 9, 27. It must establish a Palestinian state in Judea, the West Bank. And you, can, you understand that by going to Matthew chapter 24, when Jesus said, When you see the abomination of desolation occur, let them which be in Judea flee. He specifically mentions those that are in Judea or the West Bank, modern day. He's not talking about 2,500 years ago or any time in between. He's talking about, in the, this is the last days we're talking about, at the time of the Antichrist. So it's going to establish a Palestinian state in Judea. Jesus painted that picture for us in Matthew 24. The peace agreement will also allow the Jews, the Jewish settlers that are presently living in Judea, to remain in their homes living as a Jewish minority in that new Palestinian state. It will also place the Temple Mount under an internationally supervised sharing arrangement, allowing both Jews and Muslims to worship there. It will allow Israel to build her third temple. And number five, Israel will retain control of Jerusalem throughout the end time. Those are the five biblical characteristics of the peace agreement in Daniel 9, 27. So, you've got to be able to understand this. We're, we're going to live through this. And I don't want you to miss this stuff because you're watching something else. When you see the prophesied agreement with those characteristics, then you can know assuredly that the final seven years to the Battle of Armageddon and the second coming of Jesus Christ has begun. So, there's a lot of things happening right now, isn't there? Very quickly. And there's, I've, I've been reading all these articles um, about things that are setting us up for the Mark of the Beast system and different things. And the central bank digital current, current, uh, currencies and how they're, they're pushing them around the world. And there are world enthusiasts um, that want to impose digital currencies and these digital IDs on all of their respective populations. That's why a lot of people are considering Birch Gold. You know, these, these entities, these globalists, could even allow officials to prohibit you from purchasing certain products or to freeze or seize part of your money. In essence, and believe me, you want to understand this? There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of articles. We've done so many programs on this, and we're going to do a lot more. We're going to have some more guests on as well. Probably have Bob Costa and some different people back on. So, in essence, they're enabling the government to take, to take more control over your finances. 
and there are some concerned Americans that are diversifying their assets into physical gold. It's certainly an option, and they're doing it with the help of Birch Gold Group. If you want a physical asset held in maybe a tax-sheltered retirement account, go to birchgold.com slash end time to get your free info kit on gold. Maybe you've got an IRA or a 401k uh, from a previous employer that you just had for years and you, you're wanting to, to just change it over maybe into gold. Well, Birch Gold can help you do that into an IRA in gold and you don't have to pay a penny out of pocket. So go to birchgold.com slash end time, claim your free info kit on gold because if digital currencies become a reality and it looks like they're just kind of pushing them, pushing them all around the world, you may want to wish you had some gold to fall back on, right? Now, as we're walking along this timeline, we have to mention the Sixth Trumpet War. Because at this juncture, there is a war that's on the immediate horizon that's going to emanate from the Middle East region and result in the killing of one-third of the world's population. I don't want the war to occur, but it's going to. It's in the prophecies of the Bible. The prophecies always come to pass. And this war is called the Sixth Trumpet War because it occurs at the sounding of the Sixth Trumpet. That's described in Revelation 9, verse 13 through 21. The war is going to take place either just before or shortly after the peace agreement is signed. It's always been our opinion, and I'm telling you this is opinion, that it would happen prior to the signing of the peace agreement. Uh, again, that's speculation because I cannot prove specifically whether it happens just before or shortly after, uh, scripturally. But the Bible does tell us that it must take place at the latest before the final three and one half years begins, and it could conceivably happen at, t at any time if it hasn't already happened. Now, that leads me to misconception number four. The next biblical war to occur. Now, there, there will be some different, uh, the Bible, Jesus said you'd hear of wars and rumors of wars. I mean, all the way to the end, there's going to be different conflicts and different things. But the next major biblical war that will occur is not Gog and Magog of Ezekiel 38 and 39. It's not Psalm 83. It's not Zechariah 12 through 14 or the Battle of Armageddon in Revelation 16 and 19. The next one is the Sixth Trumpet War in Revelation 9, verse 13 through 21. That's why you've got to understand the book of Revelation is not written in chronological order, and that we are walking through the different accounts of the second coming of Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation as we speak. The first four seals have been loosed. The first five trumpets have um, sounded, and those events have already occurred. So we're staring the Sixth Trumpet War right in the face if it hasn't already begun with this current conflict in with Israel, Hamas, Hezbollah, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, the Houthis, and the head of the snake, Iran. In the, in the aftermath of this six trumpet war, in which 2.7-ish, we just went over 8 billion last November. I don't know specifically where we're at. Somewhere just over 8 billion. So 2.7 billion, roughly, human beings will have died in this war. There will be a cry of peace. It's going to be deafening. And they're going to be screaming for a global organization that can prevent war from ever happening again. The international community is going to adopt a world governing entity to eliminate the possibility of a global war ever taking place again. That's what the League of Nations was to World War I. That's what the United Nations was to World War II. Well, on the heels of World War III, there's going to be a fully functioning world governing body with dictatorial powers like they wanted the first two to have. The nations of the world are going to surrender their sovereignty, their armies, their just, they're going to yield up, their, they're going to do away with their borders to the new world government so that it can limit, it supposedly eliminate war completely. It's not going to work because the Antichrist is going to be fighting, facing resistance all the way to the end, and then the Battle of Armageddon is going to happen. So world government is never going to be the answer to war. Now, <coughs> excuse me, 
the world government is going to be the culmination of years of planning that have already been in progress. It's happening decades. And <clears throat> for several years, it has been generally believed that there were two major causes of war on the earth, conflicts between nations and conflicts between religions. So the solution, I mean, what's going on right now in the world? You've got Russia, Ukraine. That is conflict between nations, a geopolitical situation. You've got China, Taiwan, the potential for that. That's a geopolitical situation. And then you have religious conflicts, which, are, which is Iran preparing for the Mahdi and the 12th Imam to come. And they've got a, you know, they're wanting to, to implement Sharia law globally. And they see Russia, uh, um, Israel and the United States is standing in the way of that. So there's, that's, a, that's proof positive what I, the statement I just made, the two conflicts in the earth, main, the main ones. So the solution in the minds of these global leaders is simple. Number one, do away with the nation states and force everyone on earth to pledge allegiance to one single ultimate political authority or a world government. Number two, abolish the doctrinal differences between all religious organizations and coerce churches and the church leaders to sign declarations of unity with a single all-inclusive religious authority or a world religion. Now, I mean, look at it, look what's going on right now with um, Pope Francis and, and his Laudato C encyclical back in 2015 and now Laudato Diem that he just come out with. And now he's going to go talk, talk at the uh, Conference of Parties, COP28, and he's pushing this, this uh, propaganda narrative by the United Nations of human-induced global warming, which leads to climate change, and that we're destroying the earth, and we're not going to leave anything for future generations, and uh, as a result, you know, there's climate change is happening, and it's this existential threat for humanity, and it, it's a complete false narrative, you guys. You understand what's going on here. And so they, the world government is weaponizing churches to get them to push on the people that they're influential over, their false narratives of the world government. And this is exactly what the Bible says is going to happen in Revelation chapter 13, verse 11 through 15. So, the Bible, this, the Bible predicts that the world government and the world religion will be governed by a duo of the most deceitful, demonic human, humans that have ever lived. To begin with, there's going to be a leader that will arise from Europe. This is Daniel 7, 8. That will have aided in the negotiations for the prophesied peace agreement. He's going to be this great orator, uh, an, an administrator. He's going to be, um, you know, he's going to have this ulterior motive in mind. He's going to be a wolf in sheep's clothing. Think about that type of situation. Uh, the Antichrist. And he's eventually going to seize the reins of influence, usurp authority over a world governing body, and he's going to be the most powerful politician in Europe. And from that power base, he will maneuver himself into control of the emerging world government. Now, this brings me to misconception number five. The Antichrist will come from Europe. You must understand that. He's not going to come from the Middle East. He's not going to come from the United States of America. How do I know that? The ten-horned beast in Daniel chapter 7, symbolizes the current European Union. And if you look in that chapter, the Bible says the little horn uproots three of those horns, become great, and has a mouth speaking great things. That's the Antichrist. So, it's conclusive proof that the Antichrist will come from the European Union, the reborn Holy Roman Empire. So, it, it, it really helps when you, find, when you start to understand these things. It's all scriptural. I want to go to scriptures with everything we teach. We're going to scripture, going to scripture, unless it's my opinion. Okay? We're not going to go off tradition. We're not going to go off a bunch of prophecy books. We're going to go off of scripture. We're going to stick by that, like super glue, because it's the word of God. I don't know the end from the beginning. God does. And so that's what we're going to go off of. Now, and another thing I want to say, this is very, very important because I cover this all the time with Bible studies and, and conferences and just people all around the world. 
they'll, they will email me and say, I, I've got this one verse, and you guys are wrong with what you teach because of this one verse. And I'll say, well, what about this, these other ten verses over here? And they're like, well, I hadn't considered that. So make sure that when you're going to study any topic in the Bible, the oneness of God, uh, holiness, um, the different dispensations, uh, prophecy, um, salvation, whatever you're, any topic that you're going to study in the Bible, make sure that you get every verse that pertains to that topic. And then you can understand the big scope of what the writers, all of the writers, that God was trying to say through them, because it's God's word, but he used several different secretaries to write it all down, right? And so God knows the end from the beginning. And he went back and he told Ezekiel some of it. He told Zechariah some of it. He told Daniel. He told Isaiah. And then um, Jesus spoke of it when he was here in fleshly form. And then some of it came through the Apostle Paul. Some of it came through Peter. Some of it came through John in the book of Revelation. And just It's all through. And there's, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of verses. So... If you're going to study something, make sure you go through, take the time and go through every single one and know what the big scope of what God was trying to say through all of the writers. Just don't pick one verse out and hang your hat on that one because you're going to get stuck when you call me and say, Dave, you guys are teaching something wrong. Look at this verse. And I say, well, what about all the other 20 chapters on it? You know, there's a whole nother, and everybody will say, man, hadn't considered that. I just want everybody to know the truth. And so that's what I, I'm a truth seeker. And so that's the most important thing here. The Bible says you should know the truth. The truth will set you free. I want to know the truth. And God wanted us all to know the truth. So that's why he gave us his word. But there's 31,000 plus verses in the Bible. So if I'm going to get the thesis of the Bible... I've got to look at the whole thing, right? So that's what we're going to do when we're going to study a topic, prophecy or anything else. We're going to go to the whole book because I want to consume the whole thing, don't I? Because I want to know the truth. As a viewer of the End Time Show, you're getting early access to Christmas deals starting right now. Do you remember that feeling you had as a kid during the holidays? What experiences and gifts would you receive this year? Well, the atmosphere at End Time is nearly the same. We're excited because these deals are now available through the end of 2023. Why are we so thrilled? Because we know these resources transform lives, and that's even more fun than Christmas, especially in these tough times. For the remainder of 2023, you can get deals like a special VIP group video call with Dave Robbins when you get Understanding the End Time. End Time Plus subscription for 50% off, or my personal favorite, a $10 and under sale for almost 100 different products featuring Irvin Baxter, Dave Robbins, and more. Go to endtime.com slash deals for a full catalog of items. You can also call 800 End Time. Hurry, supplies are limited. Go to endtime.com slash deals today. What if you could understand Bible prophecy? Dave Robbins, the host of the End Time Show's TV and radio programs, is holding a free prophecy conference near you. Gain peace and understanding about what the Bible says concerning end time prophecy. Call 1-800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com slash events to see when Dave will be in a location near you. Okay, welcome back, everybody. And, you know, there's a lot to these end times, right? And certainly want to make sure that we're prepared. We're preparing mentally, physically for the times just ahead and spiritually for eternity. And one of the ways that people are preparing for things is they're storing up some goods. I've had people ask me all the time, how can I prepare physically? And there's nothing wrong with, uh, people have asked me, is there anything wrong with storing some food. No, absolutely not. Why would there be anything wrong with that? Any kind of catastrophe could take place. And you know, I, I, like we've said before, I, I'd love to believe that, hey, the grocery stores are always going to be there. 
but they're really demonizing farmers and different things right now. And you, know, you just never know, right? But we've seen over the past few years, the supply chains could close for a, a period of time. Food supplies could diminish. I'm not, I mean, you never know what's going to happen in the future. So we got to pray for the best, but we got to prepare for the worst, right? I mean, I trust God. I trust God, but I still wear a seatbelt, right? And there's nothing wrong with a little preparation. I mean, what, what if there was a way that you can have an affordable three-month emergency supply of food? Well, there actually is. Readypantry.com slash end time. It offers this 25-year shelf-stable food. And, you know, it, they offer all kinds of different uh, types of meals. And not to mention the peace of mind you get knowing that you have this emergency supply of food if anything should happen. I'm not talking about 50 years of food, but I'm saying you could have something for a six-month period, and most things will pass within a six-month period. Let's face it, as a rule, or at least you could get some more, but you're not just hit with the initial shock. Think about a power outage that, lasts, that could last two weeks. You'd be stuck, right? I mean, a hurricane. I mean, we're down here in the south. Uh, a grid collapse. Think about back in Texas uh, or Ohio in Texas where the grid, the, uh, those big turbines froze up. I think it was last year. Rolling blackouts, war, uh, the, the list goes on and on, right? Ready Pantry is an American-based company with all the products sourced here in America. You're not going to be disappointed. Many long-term food storage companies are giving you food that's been on their shelves for years and years. Ready Pantry doesn't do that. They give you the freshest packed food and it comes straight to your home. Ready Pantry offers discounts of up to 20% off for 3 to 12 month supplies. Go to readypantry.com slash end time. Use the code end time and save an additional 10% off on your order and you don't pay any shipping ever. So, stock your pantry with, you can even do it with buy now. I know Christmas is coming up. Do some buy now, pay later options. And that's available at checkout by going to readypantry.com slash end time. Okay, now, Continuing on, <coughs> on this timeline, this, this end time, a chronological order of end time events, simultaneous with the emergence of the prophesied world government is going to be the birth of a global religious system. Interfaithism and ecumenism, I mean, it's, it's already being called. It's going to be a union of different, many different churches, Catholicism, Protestantism, and just all kinds of isms under the leadership of whoever the Pope is at the time of the end. And the religious union is going to be founded on the belief that Jews, Muslims, Christians, and all these different religions worship the same God, but they all just call him different names, right? Although the, the Bible says there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and there's, you know, neither is there salvation and then the other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. But they kind of just overlook those scriptures and say, well, there could be, you know, we all worship the same thing, we just call them different names. That's not what it's talking about in the Bible, right? Interfaithism is going to attempt to embrace all the religions of the world. And Scripture is clear that this religious union is going to be led by whoever the Pope is at that time. And whoever the Pope is at the time of the Antichrist, that individual is going to fill the prophesied role of the false prophet. And so, when you look at it, by the midway point of the final seven years, the world government led by the Antichrist and the world religion, that would be Revelation 13, 11 through 14, and chapters 17 and 18, they're headed by the false prophet. They're going to have control over the majority of the world's population. Not everybody. The Bible says that all whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life will follow after and worship the Antichrist. So there will be a group of people on the earth that do not fall prey to that. Now, that's going to bring us to the first three and one half years, right? And, of course, that's when the final seven years begins. Revelation 11, 1 and 2 says that the Temple Mount in Jerusalem will be placed under a sharing arrangement between Jews and Muslims. The Jewish people are going to be allowed to build their third temple. That's 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. Revelation 11, 1 and 2, they're going to build it on the Temple Mount. And when the temple is completed, animal sacrifices are going to be resumed. Daniel 9, 27 just as it was done in the Old Testament times. The offering of the animal sacrifices in the temple, they're going to quickly escalate into this world crisis. You can see that happening already. 
and the animal rights activists are going to demand that the Antichrist stop the slaughter of these animals. And it's the dispute over the animal sacrifices that's going to quickly lead to an event called the abomination of desolation. And the abomination of desolation is halfway through that final seven year period. That's very important when you're trying to figure out the timing of all of this. Once we reach the middle of that final seven year period, there are going to be prophetic, prophetic events. You think they're happening fast now. Well, wait till we get to that point. They are going to rapidly increase, and many events are going to be happening simultaneously. And they're happening that way now, but it's just going to be, you know, it's going to be much more visible. A lot of people question, but man, when that happens, you're going to, the, the third temple is going to be built. Think about that. So, the first of these events is going to be the stopping of the sacrifices at the abomination of desolation. Daniel 11.31 says that arms shall stand on his part, and they, the Antichrist and his partners, shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. So it appears that the stopping of the sacrifices, the abomination of desolation, is going to occur just about the same time. And the Antichrist is going to explain that the sacrifices, you guys don't need these anymore because I'm the Messiah. I'm God. I'm the, the 12th Imam. I'm the Mahdi you've been looking for. I'm, the, I'm Buddha. He's going to claim to be God to everybody. 2 Thessalonians 2, 4 states that he will sit in the temple of God claiming to be God. And in that passage, the Apostle Paul described that event as the revealing of the man of sin or the revealing of the Antichrist. Prior to that, we can speculate who he is, but we won't know. And we should also mention that whoever the Pope is, again, at the time of the abomination of desolation, that's when he's going to assume the role of the false prophet. He's going to be the leader of the world religious system. He's going to perform miracles before the people of the world. The Bible says in Revelation uh, 13, 13, and 14, that he's actually going to pull fire down from heaven. And through those miracles, the Bible says he will influence the world to pledge its allegiance to the Antichrist. And that, Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation occur, when the Antichrist stands in the temple and proclaims to be God, that's when the great tribulation would begin. Simultaneous with, that's um, what, Matthew 24, 15 through 21. So, simultaneous with the abomination of desolation, there's going to be a war in heaven. That's Daniel 12, 1 and Revelation 12, 7 through 10. Michael and his archangels will defeat Satan and his angels and bind them to the earth. Revelation 12, 12 says, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath. It's a very important statement because he knows that he hath but a short time. So this is the beginning of the three and one half years of great tribulation. When Satan will persecute Israel, read Revelation uh, chapter 12, verse 7 down through oh, 17. And the Bible says, Rejoice you that are in heaven, but woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Satan comes down unto you having great wrath, <clears throat> and he persecutes the woman with twelve stars around her head, which is Israel, and those that have the testimony of Jesus Christ which is the true church of Jesus Christ. So it's the same tribulation period <clears throat> that Jesus spoke of. <clears throat> and, sorry, I'm still trying to get over this crazy cold, you guys. I apologize. It's the same tribulation period that Jesus spoke of in Matthew 24, 15 through 21. Once the abomination of desolation occurs, Jesus warned the Jews living in Judea, the modern day which they would call West Bank, we call it Judea, he warned them to flee into the mountains. He said, for then, this is verse 21 of Matthew 24, for then would be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning, a greatest time of persecution, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. So in the midst of all this chaos, though, you say, what are we doing, Dave? I'm walking you through the events that we're living through now and what's coming in just the near future. Because there's a lot of misconceptions going on out there. A lot of muddy water, a lot of different opinions and just, you know, you, you've got to make sure you're getting every verse that pertains to every prophecy. And so what we tried to do was kind of summarize that into a chronology of events that are going to happen that we're living through now 
and that's going to happen in the near future. So you'll know what to watch for. So in the midst of all this chaos that's taking place, this great tribulation, God is going to send His two witnesses, this is uh, Revelation 11, 3, to begin their ministries, which is the last 1260 days, or this is that three and one half year period again. And so now during the final th last three and one half years, many events are going to occur, setting the stage for the battle of Armageddon and the second coming of Jesus Christ. And it's at that time, the Antichrist and the false prophet are going to fully implement the economic system, the sanctioning system actually, uh, known as the mark of the beast. That's Revelation 13, 16 through 18. Economic control is going to be used to force the citizens of the world to comply with the dictates of the one world government and the one world religion. And that's why we're watching these global ID system and the, the global effort to implement a central bank digital currency. It's pointing us straight at the time when they will use a global economic sanctioning system. Now, the plan will be to give everyone on earth their own unique identification number that's going to be necessary to function in society. If any individual does not submit or obey or, or in essence pledge allegiance to the Antichrist and his supreme authority, then that person's number could be invalidated or they could be denied access to their central bank digital currencies. If I mean, it looks like that's coming out around the world already. There are 11 nations that have a fully implemented central bank digital currency system, and there are 119 nations working on it. So, that individual would not, in essence, they wouldn't be permitted to hold a job or to participate in the global economy. And that's exactly what Revelation uh, 13, 16 through 18 is talking about, the mark of the beast. So, all the while, during all of this, God's two witnesses, Revelation 11, uh, 3 through 12, are going to be prophesying, performing miracles, smiting the earth with plagues. But at the end of their ministries, the Antichrist and his world governing system is going to kill them. Their bodies are going to lie in the streets of Jerusalem for three and one half days while the international media broadcasts the entire incident to the world. They're actually going to be giving presents to each other and celebrating their death. But so a huge event is going to happen after they lay in the streets for three and one half days. And it's one of the events that all of us will be able to see, right? If you've got a computer, it's going to be on the front page of every news source at that point. The media will not be able to ignore it because they're going to be brought back to life. And we're going to talk about it here in a minute. A voice spoke to me and said, I've got something I want to show you. I was so sure God had talked to me. And I was stunned by what I saw. A direct fulfillment of this over 2,500 year old prophecy. The United States will stand with Israel. Why haven't I ever seen this before? One third of humanity will die. What do these beasts symbolize? The lion, the bear, the leopard. The combined beast from Revelation 13 represents the end time government of the Antichrist. Understanding the end time. Now streaming on End Time Plus and available to order at endtime.com slash UET. Go to endtime.com slash UET or call 800 End Time. They that understand what is taking place will instruct many. Except a man is born again, he can enter or see the kingdom of God. I don't care what label you've been given or what label you've given yourself, you are essential. You still matter. This is a journey, and when we get to the other side of that, that's where our prize is, that's where our reward is. Time is not going anywhere.
So, as we walk along this chronological order of events, at the end of the Great Tribulation period, at the end of the final seven years, the Great Tribulation is only the final three and one half years of that, right? We proved that earlier on in the program. At the end of that, the two witnesses are going to be killed by the, the Antichrist and his world governing body. But after three and one half days, the Lord will raise them from the dead and call them up to heaven while the whole world watches in amazement. Now, at the end of this final seven year period, two of the most recognizable prophecies in the Bible will take place the Battle of Armageddon, and the second coming of Jesus Christ. And kind of surrounding these two prophecies, there are going to be quite a number of significant prophetic events, <coughs> all leading to the beginning of the 1,000-year millennial reign of Jesus Christ on the earth. At the very end of the Great Tribulation, the seven vials or plagues of the wrath of God are going to be poured out. You can read that in Revelation 16, 1 through 21. And the first vial is poured out. The reason we know these are at the end of the Great Tribulation is because the first vial of the wrath of God that is poured out, remember, well, we'll talk to you about that in just a moment. I'll talk to you about something. I'm going to clear up another misconception here. But the first vial that is poured out on those who have received the mark of the beast during the Great Tribulation, that's the first vial of the wrath of God. You do not want to take the mark of the beast. Let's just put it like that, okay? If you don't know that by now, that would not be a good thing at all, ever. When the sixth vial is poured out, the, you know, the, there's, there's obviously two through five. The water's turned to blood. The rivers and are, different things are turned to blood. There is the sun is given power to scorch men. The uh, Antichrist kingdom goes dark. But then when the sixth vial is poured out, the great river Euphrates is dried up in preparation for the kings of the east to make their way down toward Israel for the battle of Armageddon. Once the six vials poured out, this is very important because I got asked this by a pastor friend of mine the other day. He didn't really understand what end time ministries believed. And I explained it to him in great detail and he said, man, never have saw that before, Dave. So once the sixth vial of the wrath of God is poured out, Revelation 16, 15 gives a last-minute warning to the inhabitants of the earth. And it says, Jesus said, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Now, this is when the rapture occurs. You say, whoa, whoa, whoa hold on, Dave. I thought you guys were pre-wrath. Okay, so this brings me to Misconception number six, that the rapture occurs before the Great Tribulation. Jesus, now, I believe that the entire Bible is the Word of God. So some people would say, well, Jesus said this, but the apostles said that. It's all the Word of God. You either believe that or you don't, right? So Jesus said that the Great Tribulation, or the uh, rapture occurs after the Tribulation. Okay? Go to Matthew in the Olivet Discourse. Go to Matthew 24, 29 through 31. Jesus said, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, moon shall not give her light, stars shall fall from heaven, the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the, crowd, for the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. That's the last trump. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds of heaven, from one, from one end of heaven to the other. Now, before we go any further, that event where the Lord comes in the clouds, send his angels with the sound of a great trumpet to gather together his elect, that event only happens one time in the near future. One time. The last trump only happens one time. The seventh trump, which is the last trump, only happens one time. And Jesus said in verse um, 29 that that event would occur immediately after the tribulation of those days. Now, then in verse 16, Jesus goes on, because remember, immediately uh, in, after the sixth vial, 
Behold, I come as a thief. Then in verse 16, the prophecy says, and he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. So, here's a misconception number seven. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord and Jesus Christ. I agree with that 110%. I believe in the Bible. I believe the Bible is the infallible Word of God. Okay. So, I believe that we're not appointed unto wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Some teach, because of this scripture though, that the church has to be gone by the time the wrath of God is poured out. So, first, the great tribulation is not the wrath of God. You got to make sure you get that. Revelation chapter 12, the war in heaven, Michael and his archangels overcome Satan and his angels. The Bible says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, but uh, because um, rejoice you that are in heaven, but woe to the inhabitants of the earth, because Satan comes down to you having great wrath. And he persecutes the Israel and the true church of Jesus Christ um, for that three and one half year period, the time of the great tribulation. The great tribulation is the wrath of Satan, not the wrath of God. But the church will still be here. Second, Scripture does not teach a pre-wrath rapture. When people think of a pre-wrath rapture, some of them think, uh, well, the wrath is God's wrath, the great tribulation is God's wrath, we're going to be gone. Also, the church will be here through the first six vials of the wrath of God. You say, whoa, whoa, Dave, you're throwing me. Well, this is what the, me and this pastor talked about the other day. Because he said, oh, I, Dave, I thought you guys were pre-wrath. He actually said, I believe in a post-trib rapture, but I'm pre-wrath. Or he said, we believed in pre-wrath. I said, no, no, we don't believe in a pre-wrath. Because listen at this. Once, again, once the sixth vial of the wrath of God is poured out, Revelation 16 gives that last-minute warning to the inhabitants of the earth. Behold, I come as a thief. Jesus Christ only comes as a thief one time in the near future. Remember the Apostle Paul in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5. Men and brethren, you have no need that I write unto you these things, because you know yourself that the Lord comes as a thief in the night. He's only coming once as a thief in the night. It's in the near future. It's immediately at the end of the Great Tribulation period and after the first six vials of the wrath of God. You say, but Dave, the Bible says we're not appointed under the wrath of God. It does say that. The wrath of God will not be poured out upon the church. Remember, the uh, first vial of the wrath of God is poured out upon those that receive the mark of the beast. The vials of the wrath 2 through 6 are poured out upon the armies. It's contained in Israel, and it's poured out upon the armies. And 7, the vial number 7 is poured out upon the armies that come down against Israel to battle. Those vials are, are saved for them. And those, are, those are not pertain to the church. So... The church will be here until Revelation 16, 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth, keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. So, the Lord only comes as a thief once in the future, and that is after the six vials of the wrath of God. So, I'm not pre-wrath, but the wrath is simply not poured out upon the church. And remember that uh, the original, when the um, Israelites were down in Egyptian bondage, many of the ten plagues that came on Egypt did not fall on the Israelites. Okay? God's got a way of judging whoever he wants. I mean, he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, right? And so, but yet he didn't destroy uh, Lot's family. You say, well, there, that proves a pre-tribulation rapture. God got them out before he, he poured out his wrath. That does not prove a pre-tribulation rapture because what about all the other scriptures in the Bible that prove a post-trib rapture? The Bible is never going to contradict itself. The Bible says God is not the author of confusion. So, we've got to get this stuff right, right? We just want to teach the truth. 
and we want to, I want people to be saved. I want people to go to heaven. But if, there, if 30 percent of the entire Bible is going to be Bible prophecy, I want to understand it, and I want you to understand it, because I want to know how to navigate some waters just ahead. The Bible says the sons of Issachar were men who had understanding to know what Israel ought to do. Well, that's where we're at today. J uh, Daniel 11:32 and 33, they that understand among the people, they that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits, and they that understand among the people will just keep it to themselves, right? No. The Bible says they that understand among the people will instruct many. So we want to we clear up some of the fog, and we want to make sure that the, the muddy water is going downstream and that everything we can see it clearly, right? So I wanted to clear up some misconceptions today. Of course, at the very end of this, uh, this chronological order of events, we would have the Battle of Armageddon. Jesus Christ comes back. We have the rapture happens. We have the marriage supper of the Lamb in the sky. We go straight to fight on behalf of Israel at the Battle of Armageddon. And that's when God plants his feet upon the Mount of Olives. And that's when the Bible says at the seventh trump, Revelation chapter 11, that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he will establish the 1,000, his kingdom here on the earth for 1,000 year reign. The ones who are raptured, uh, the, the saints who have been born again, the Old Testament saints that were saved under those um, different plans of salvation during the different dispensations, they will all be raised at the time of the rapture, and we will be changed from mortal to immortal, and we will rule and reign as kings and priests with him during that 1,000 year millennial reign. At the end of that, the great white throne of judgment, and then we move off into eterna, our eternal existence with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, that is a very, very quick overview of a chronology of end time events. But one of the key statements is that the, these prophecies are spread out over 2,500 years just and more. And they're scattered through all kinds of uh, books in the Bible, and, I mean, so if you're going to study a certain topic, make sure that you get all, of, do your research, make sure you get all of the verses that pertain to that topic, and that way you can see, look at it in, in the big picture and say, okay, now I understand what God was trying to say. Hopefully, that's why here, End Time Ministries here, to help you understand the end time. That's what the new book's all about. That's what the new DVDs are all about, helping you understand the end times. God bless.